Hi, welcome to After Dinner Conversation, short stories for long discussions. You are listening to myself, Colby, as well as Jeremy and Jessica. We are uh, doing what we do every week. We're doing podcasts about stories from the website After Dinner Conversation. You can download these stories on Amazon. You can listen to our podcast wherever Amazon is played, as well as YouTube. So you can watch it. Maybe you're watching it right now. Um, and if you're enjoying this, please like or subscribe. It allows us to continue doing what we love. We have a heck of a good time, as you can probably tell if you've listened to other episodes, uh, doing these. And the whole point of this is to encourage sort of intelligent adult conversa adultish conversation about, uh, about interesting ethical topics. And if you've got a story you'd like to submit and you think, oh, that was great, uh, just go to our website uh, after dinner conversation and uh, submit it. One of us will read it, probably me. Uh, and uh, and then assuming that we like it, it'll get published, and maybe we'll be discussing it because that's all, all the stuff that we get is stuff that people have sent us um, that we like, and we're like, oh yeah, we could totally talk about that and talk about yeah. the Hobson's choice of it as it was last week. Yeah, um, we are once again uh, for the tenth time now. Ten. This is our tenth episode in La Guitarra. I have finally learned how to say it by the tenth <laughs> episode, uh, where they have cats that are available for for uh, adoption. For adoption. Uh, we've so if you hear screeching in the background, that is probably the cats letting us know that they are having a good time, having a little cat party. Uh, if you uh, don't want to adopt a cat, but you just want to come visit cats because you like having stuff on countertops at home, uh, you can just pay ten bucks <laughs> and uh, come and sit come, with the cats. Yeah, come sit with the cats. It reminds me of the joke where the cat walks into a bar and the the cat says, "I've had a really bad day. Can I have a drink?" And the bartender puts it up there, and the cat goes, <laughs> "Pour me another." <laughs> and it's just like, just knocks it off the countertop. I think that's a great cat joke. Uh, that is a good there cat are cat very cat few joke. solid cat jokes. Uh, at any it rate, was, it was perfect. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> uh, the so the Please story stop. we're talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> you're not a dad. You don't get to tell dad jokes. Oh, darn it. Uh, is Alpha Die Shirt Factory by Tyler Kurt. Jessica drew the short straw, and so she gets to do the uh, the honors. For, obviously, ideally, you should have read the story beforehand, but we know not everyone does. So uh, Jessica's going to get you up to speed. I will say you should read the story before, beforehand, but um, uh, you don't have to. I feel like our ethical and moral discussions tend to be so broad that you don't need to read the story to listen. <laughs> but I, I would recommend that people yeah. go and listen. I, I will be the first to say I listened to Car Talk for years. And not once have I worked on a car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, point, point. Yeah. All right. So the Alpha Dye Shirt Factory, um, the narrator is Mary, and she works at the Alpha Dye Shirt Factory as a seamstress. Um, the story opens where she is um, working, and her friend Maria um, asks her to come into the bathroom, and there's this whole backstory about the rules of working in the factory and how many minutes they get for a bathroom break and how you can time it so that you can talk to somebody. Um, and as somebody who worked in call center once, very similar rules. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, Maria tells Mary that she's engaged and it's against the rules to be engaged at the shirt factory, um, which is, again, not the call center rules. But, you know. Well, this is probably earlier than you worked at the call center. Probably. Yeah. Let's, let's, not, let's not date me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so Maria um, tells her that she got engaged, and Mary's very happy for her, and then they smell smoke. And that is really kind of the setup when for... When they come out of the bathroom, I think it is? Or? Yeah, I think they it's hear like, a commotion, they yeah, come out of the bathroom. come out of the bathroom, and the smoke is coming up from the... The, the first floor. The They're first on the second floor, floor, yeah. The first floor um, is clearly on fire, and the smoke is coming up through the floorboards. Um, she mentions the fire escape, and uh, the fire escape being just rusty, and... People start pouring out into the fire escape. The fire escape collapses, um, and um, she watches like the people on the fire escape fall to their death. Yes, as it yes. collapses. Yeah, yeah, and then the floor falls out. Um, right. So it, it, it's I a think, wooden floor, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah and like so, old timey. Yep. And so old timey. I have a wooden floor. Well, but uh, not, you don't have. A, you're not in a six story building with wooden floors. That's true. I mean, maybe they do. I have no idea. Um, and so the floor falls out, and then um, it. she spends the rest of the story trying to determine first if she's going to try to escape, and then knowing that she's not going to escape, and trying to decide if she would rather be burned alive, um, or uh, first she tries to do smoke inhalation. She tries to kill herself by falling asleep because of smoke inhalation. Her body rejects that. She's coughing. Um, and then she tries to go to the window, uh, and she decides to throw herself out the window 
to. And apparently not on the second story. They're much higher up much in the higher. building. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, seven good, story. She's seven. in the seven story, yeah. Okay. Um, so and, probably fatal. Yeah, probably fatal. Although she is the narrator. I will say, you know, we don't we don't get anything mm. that says that she's not. She seems to be telling the story because right. she says, like, my name is Mary, right? She's not – this is not – Oh, that's a good point. Right. Yeah. She is – so we don't really know the fate of her except that she chooses to jump out the window because she'd rather die from falling than from, from being, being burned alive. alive. Yeah. Um, and that is Another our, cheery story. Another cheery yeah. story. Thurman last week was a cheery story. Yeah. We need, we need a story about just, like, two cats walking into a bar – <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of ethical and moral complications with that, but well, we could maybe. If you're, a dog, if, you're, if you're a dog bartender, if you were a writer out there and you would like to write the a dog cat dilemma bartender story. cat yes. dilemma story, I can't serve those cats <laughs> against my ethics. All right, so yeah. let's start out our conversation. Colby, what'd you think? What? Uh, so, uh, so first of all, I think it's a it's a direct mirror. I think of um, what is it called? The uh, Triangle Shirt Factory. Triangle shirt waist coast factory. So I assume it took place late 1800s, early 1900s, certainly before there were a ton of OSHA regulations. Um, and so this story is roughly true in that there was a shirt factory that caught on fire. And I mean, there's still shirt factories. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. well, it's still... not in America, but yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, it, uh, and because there were no regulations, uh, many of the people died. Many of them jumped out of windows. Many of them jumped down the elevator shaft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a, a I guess the, the good part that came out of that is because it was such headline news, uh, we got a lot of our safety regulations for high rises and stuff out of it so that it would be harder to happen in the future. Um, what did I think of it? Uh, honestly, it struck. So I'm reading it and I'm thinking, like, it's a story, it's a story, it's a story. Oh, this is, you know, it's a sad story. And then I got to the questions. And and it started talking about I think uh, like suicide or depression or all those sort of things, mm. and then I was like, oh, it's not a story about um, about a fire in a factory. It's a story about the choices that you make that are logical choices internally, but could be illogical choices to somebody looking externally. Mm. Give me an example. Um, so, and this is just my own personal opinion, but okay. uh, I mean, I guess everything that is personal is your personal opinion. But uh, I think there is an assumption that people that commit suicide are taking a coward's way out or they are, um, they're somehow being uh, selfish or disrespectful or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, having been a person who went through years of depression, I think uh, it's, it's easy to say as an outsider looking in, it's harder when you're in that situation and you feel like this is as good as it gets and it will never get good again. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it is a little bit like the situation of do I want to just burn alive forever or do I want to end the burning? And in that sense, uh, I, I think – I'm not condoning suicide, of course, but I think uh, it becomes a rational choice. Mm -hmm to that person based on their perspective. Mm -hmm. And so to, I think, belittle that choice by saying that it is cowardly or cheap or you're a quitter or whatever, I think is disrespectful to that choice. I certainly think that suicide's not a great idea, and I certainly think that your choice, it's selfish in that the people who love you will miss you, right. and you're choosing to end your own pain at the cost of other people's pain. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I, I want to end my pain and therefore I'm going to put pain on my, you know, my mom or my dad or my friends or my kids or whoever loves me because my pain is more important than the pain I'm going to cause them. Mm -hmm. um, right. but, I can but, see that. but do I understand how a person who feels like nobody would miss them right. or that nobody would be sad about their loss would see it as a rational choice? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example that came up, and then I'll shut up so we can talk about others. I'll, you guys can chime in. Uh, at like 85 or 90 years old, Kurt Vonnegut committed suicide. Mm -hmm. He'd been depressed his whole life. That was one, He was just clinically depressed, and it shows up in his writing. And I remember uh, when I first heard, I was really crushed by this because he's a writer I greatly admire. And I was like, how – like, do you understand? Like, even if you just wrote, like, doodles on napkins, you would be adding to the sum of humanity because you are that amazing. Mm -hmm. 
but then it, but then I have to remind myself, like, well, like he stuck it out for like 85 years or 90 years or however old he was. He gave us 15 books that are all astounding. It's like I, I mean, I guess you're like you're allowed to be done. Uh, and there's been, like, was it Gordon Ramsay, I think, committed suicide? No, no, no. Who, not no. Gordon Ramsay. I don't even know anything Anthony about Bourdain. Him. Anthony Bourdain. Jeez yeah. Louise. I mean, so you just, you hear about famous people that have committed suicide, and you're like, you have everything. You are like... Robin the Williams. Robin, Robin Williams, Williams is a great example, right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I think it's easy to be angry until you've had, until you have been in that situation. Well, and I think it's easy to be, I think, uh, so... I think things mitigate um, people taking their own life, right? So uh, a lot of times as a society, right? So if somebody um, has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, which I um, believe is what Robin Williams was diagnosed with um, when when he decided to take his own life, um, when somebody has been diagnosed with a terminal disease, sure. right? We are much more accepting as a society of something that... Um, if, Again, this is a way out of that pain. Right. This is a way out of that pain. And we, we can, that is a logical step for society. It, it's Although society sometimes society. an illegal step, right? So, so, sometimes to have doctor-assisted like, suicide or right. you commit suicide is illegal, even though I don't know how you ticket the person after right, they're right, dead or right. whatever. But I think we as a society are okay with that. But if it's depression, if it's a mental illness, we have a lot harder time with that. Um, because we, A, as a society, I think we do a terrible job of admitting that mental illness is, a, is, an, is an illness. illness. Right. right. You just want to be like, just try harder. Right. Like, Go just, outside. Right. Um, uh, and we have a hard time with the idea that we want to fix that because it is a mental illness. We think that, um, you know, medicine can be in charge of fixing a broken um, bone, a broken or, bone whatever. Or, or a disease. And if they fail, then we're okay. That legitimizes that person taking their life. But with a mental illness, we, we don't, we don't think that it's something that necessarily medicine can solve because it's not always is. It's not always something that medicine can it's solve. It's a much more complicated problem. Right, sure. much more complicated And problem. as a society, we think that it is something you can pull yourself out of. You can pull yourself out of. You're not trying hard enough. Or sometimes right. I think, you know, society is, it does take the, um, take the blame and like, yes, it's bad and we should try harder to save you. Um, which I think is something that I don't necessarily think is the is it, there is definitely cause and effect of, of you know ostracizing people or making making that making depression something that is ostracizable, um, but I don't think that necessarily it's like if we were just nicer to one another, people would not be depressed. That's not a thing. Yeah, right. And that's one of my frustrations with. I mean, when I was going through a long bout of depression, one of the things that was frustrating to me is people were like, "You don't seem depressed." Right. And I'm like, no, it's do you understand that depression isn't sadness? Right. It's a totally different thing. Like I can be on a jet ski and be depressed. Like it's got nothing to do with it for smiling. It's mm -hmm. just this thing that just sits on you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that I don't know. How to describe it to somebody who hasn't experienced it. Yeah, who hasn't it. experienced it. And it's like, no, I like I can be happy and be depressed. Like that's they're, they're not the same thing. It's not yeah. like the people that say, like, well, the last time I saw him, he seemed fine. Right. Yeah, no, that's you're totally missing the point of what depression yeah. is. Right. What clinical depression is in that sense, right? Right. Wow, that's a mood killer. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that I thought, one of the questions that actually I thought was, was interesting for me is what if she had been wrong? Because that goes back to the issue of depression, right? Right. Like it feels like it's forever. It feels like you're, you can't get out of the building. But, uh, but it's possible... Two minutes later is when the fire truck yes. with the longer ladder shows up. Right. And right. so do you have a sort of obligation to life to take the burn in the hopes that the, the, the better fire truck shows up? Or are you allowed to uh, are you allowed to like help yourself? Uh, again, I think that comes back down to really the, the pain that you're feeling at some point, you know. In this, in this metaphor, you're deciding, right. and I don't like, like when you had enough. Much, uh, right, this is as much as you can take, and you know, it, I don't think that matters that if two minutes later, the fire truck is just late. Right. Yeah. 
Well, and I think it's interesting at the end of the story, she talks about when she's deciding to jump, one of the things that she says is like, don't aim for a body. Try and not I, to take anybody down with me. Right. And, and I was like, no, no, aim for a body. <laughs> and then it becomes this question like, do you... I aim for the I aim for the most expensive car I can find. That's what I do. I'm gonna I'm gonna take down a rich person's insurance coverage with it. <laughs> I was like, land on something soft that could be another person. Uh, right. You look plump. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And and so then it becomes uh, I, this idea of do I die and know that death death is certain, right? Like, mm-hmm. do I take this way out and know that death is certain, or do I aim for a a, a, a big old pile of people? And hope that I'm just that it breaks my fall. Thoroughly maimed, but recoverable, right? right? And so then it's I can either have an agonizing maybe death, mm-hmm. or agonizing and then recovery and then living with those injuries, right? Which is a very interesting when we're paralleling it to something like a terminal illness or to mm-hmm. depression, right? Do I end it now and know that it's over, or do I continue to suffer and hope that either I get better? Or I also die, and it's the same outcome. It's just in But I died is, fighting. I died well, fighting in pain. I died yeah, fighting. the do I go through all of this chemotherapy and radiation right. oh, treatment. Yes. So yes. That's my, my, that was one of my mom's decisions. Yeah. So when she was diagnosed, she got diagnosed with breast cancer and bone cancer at the same time. Uh, and she was like, I don't want, I don't want chemo. She's like, I, I was a nurse for 35 years. I've, I've seen, seen what, what chemo does. does to people. I know that I'm 70 years old. Like, I don't want to spend a couple of miserable years to get five more. And, and I'm a two-pack-a-day smoker. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's like cancer. lifestyle change. Yeah, she was never going to quit smoking. And so she just decided, like, I'm I'm good. Like, I'm good. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, maybe if she was 40, I'd be more upset at her. But uh, I guess at 70, I'm less upset. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, one, of the, one of the true things that came out of the the... I, I researched this. <gasps> one of what? The, that, one of I'm the, sorry. That is Jeremy's role. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're he fired. The researcher. Yeah. I've been researching. Uh, one of the things that there, there are a couple of people who survived on the top floors of the shirt factory fire, okay. the triangle. Uh, and, and it's interesting the way some of them, in the sense that they tried, right? Like they, right. they, they simply tried. One of the women uh, slid down, like, like Matrix style, slid down the wire in the elevator shaft. Okay. Oh, dang. Uh, until she burned all of the skin to the bones on her hands and she had to let go. And then Man. she dropped the last three or four stories. But so many people had fallen down the oh, elevator yeah. shaft first. I told you, pile that of the people. pile the of bodies. bodies. She landed on the piles of bodies. She knocked herself unconscious. When they later were pulling all the bodies out, uh, she, was she, still w- alive. She, was on, she was lined up with the bodies on the sidewalk and like woke up and was like, I'm not oh. dead. <sighs> right. Uh, and had just a concussion and burned hands. Oh, and that wow. was the thing. Um, and another woman who jumped out of one of the top stories, she jumped out for the flagpole that hangs out of like the third store of the building and grabbed it and it and snapped stopped. off and it slid down and snapped off and it slowed her down enough oh, that she broke she... her legs and lived. Wow. Yeah. That's Man, incredible. That's rough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and those are, I think, in some ways, those are in ways, the things we make movies of and the heroes that we have are the people who have every reason to stop trying and but try anyway. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, yeah. Because I mean, we somehow view that as heroic. We definitely view that as heroic. And it, I mean, to, to some point it is heroic, right? Like to, to, um, that's a lot of tenacity. No chance, but no choice. Right. 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 And it, I imagine you hear that a lot from military veterans too, who get awards. Yeah, they were like, definitely. no, 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 they were shooting at me. I shot back. It just so happens, right. like, like you know, this was this was the best of a bad situation, right? Yeah, I think absolutely that's true. Um, hmm. I think it's interesting, like if if you read any Holocaust survivor stories, like the amount of like, we were just talking about night a couple of days ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Jeremy and I. Oh, were, yeah. I love that book. Yeah, yeah it's. A, I think it should be mandatory reading. Uh, but well, like in that book and in a lot of the Holocaust stories, the the will to live somehow exceeds the body's will to live, right? Like right. the people who lived and died, it was almost this mental desire to not die. Right. At that level of sort of starvation and exhaustion. Well, I will also say probably the people that died also had that same Oh, mental. sure, sure. <laughs> it just right. didn't work. It just didn't work for right. them. That's very possible. Uh, and I think a lot of it people is People get chance. sent on the long marches. And yeah. All that, yeah. I think a lot of it is chance. I think a lot of it is, you know, 
um, you know, this person had, you know, X percent more body fat when they arrived right. and therefore they could survive slightly a little bit better longer. conditions, had better yeah. shoes, right? Whatever, exactly. Yeah. Um, but like the mental ten tenacity it takes to get through uh, a situation like that, like every time I read a survivor story, I'm just like, and here's the part where I die right. because <laughs> literally I'm exhausted reading it. I can't imagine like, having to live through something like no. that. No, yeah. this is it's the part where I'm like, I'm good. Right. Like right. I'm good. And yeah. then and then for a lot of Holocaust survivors or survivors of lots of situations, there's that survivor's guilt, right? The the chance, whatever the chance was, the shoes, the you know, extra right. body fat, whatever it was, that allowed them to survive was not because they were a better person or because, you know, there there wasn't a worthy. They were just part standing in the it. right place at the right time. Exactly. Yeah. And so then it becomes this it's I, just I was a chance. Um, yeah. I w that was the chance that that I survived, and now I feel terrible that that chance was me. And so, do you feel like um, a person who either has a terminal illness or is clinically depressed? Do you think they have an obligation to pursue that chance? Uh, no, absolutely not. So you're willing to give people a, you're willing to give people a pass on being a quitter. Yeah, I'm absolutely. It's gonna give people because a pass it is on. their choice. The, again, do you want to go mm -hmm. through the chemotherapy? Do you want to go through? The, the potential pain for the potential out a good outcome. Yeah. And some people just don't yeah. want to make that choice. So my sister and I have a running, it's not, it's a joke, but it's not a joke, in that uh, someday one of us is going to go to the other one to the hospital, to the doctor, and the doctor is going to be like, I've got some news, and, and you know, you've you got whatever, whatever, you've got three weeks to live, whatever the case right. may be. And, uh, and, and we have a, a, an understanding that what's going to happen is this. Is we're going to walk out of the room, and my sister's going to say, so what did the doctor say? He's like, I, I'm going to tell her. He said, you're going to be fine. And then she's like, oh, good. He's like, it's just a heart palpitation. You need to drink less Pepsi. Uh, and then as we pass the dumpster, baseball bat to the back of the head, <laughs> throw her in the dumpster. So that her last thought is, she's going to be fine. Is like, it's fine. <clears throat> it's going to be fine. Like, she, you don't need those three weeks of worrying about it. Uh, and by the way, just to be clear, she has a standing order for me as well. <laughs> um, but I've also made clear to her, like, pneumonia does not count. <laughs> you know, so here's the list. Shingles. I'm gonna. I probably. It needs to be like. So I'm, you have to clarify for her. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, there's I'm, so many reasons to hit Colby with yeah. a baseball bat. But but we've had that discussion of like. Yeah, I don't, Frecker, that's discolored. Right? Oh, Colby, <laughs> get the baseball bat. You're gonna be fine. Let's walk past this dumpster. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, but we've had that discussion. Want to kick you out to this cornfield, right? But we've had that discussion <laughs> about, like, look, I, if I waver in the last weeks, don't let me waver, because I, I don't want to be that kind of burden on other people. Right. I don't want to be that kind of. I don't, I don't want to have you have that memory of me. All, all those sort of things, right? So my mom is a hospice nurse. Um, and man, so she's like an angel. She is. A, she is. I mean, an angel. Yeah. She's like the best mom yeah. in the world too. Um, but she is very much of the, like, I don't want to linger. I, I'm, you know, yeah. she's a DNR, right? Like yeah. if there's something that bad, I, I don't want, um, you know, I don't want tube feedings or anything like that. Like she, we were very clear on all her instructions, mom. Um, <laughs> however, I am the opposite. Right. I am like, I don't, I absolutely want to linger. I want to linger and linger and li I want people to curse my lingering. Um, as long as I am. You want somebody to be sponge bathing, bathing you for weeks right. before you go. But just to be clear, I as have to be conscious. conscious and I have to be of right mind. Um, and shut up. I am of right <laughs> mind right now. Shut up, Colby. That look of mine said it all. Huh? Yes, it did. You, know, you, just, you read a little too much Dylan Thomas is what I think. You're all about not going gentle into that. Good I thing. absolutely won't go gently. Yeah. Um, I, mostly because I uh, probably a big part of it is just fear of death. I'm a, a very existentialist oh. person. And so this idea that in my final moments, I'll say something super profound and it'll make it all worthwhile or whatever. Yeah. But I just, I want to, I want every single ounce of life. I want every moment to be sucked up. I don't want to go suddenly. I kind of want to know I'm going to go because I can't imagine like that. The suddenness would, it, it upsets me so much to think like I could walk out the door and get hit by a train and that would be the end. And I wouldn't even know. And it was three coming. witches would be you hackling lived. over it. <laughs> Three witches yeah. would be hackling over it from like two weeks ago. That's so yeah. true. And yet you lived in front of a train track for years. <laughs> for years. 
<laughs> for years. Yeah. Those things don't derail. I knew what was coming. <laughs> Jeremy, you've been pretty quiet on this one. Do you have uh, thoughts on? Uh, do you have a pr- like? What, no, would, what would be you your opinion have said on it this? All. Um, yeah, are we are we baseball batting you? I just need to know. <laughs> I need to know. <laughs> I need to know. I'm actually. I, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do one of those little baseball bats, <laughs> the ones that you get from like the toy store, <laughs> right? So that I have to do it like nine or ten times. Be like, <laughs> so he. So you'll know it's coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll know it's coming. No, no, don't worry. I'll use aluminum. Are you a baseball bat or are you a, are uh, you a linger? Are you a linger? I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Because um, well, I don't. Never thought I've about never thought that? about that. What about that? The, what about the jumping? Would, if you were this lady in the story, would you jump? Would you? Oh yeah, jump? definitely. Jump. You've been the jumper. You yeah, jump. yeah, firing is one of the worst ways to die. I, you know, uh, I, I, I have read. The fire is one I have of the worst read. Ways to die. Yeah, I have read from fire survivors, people that are like 70, 80 percent yeah. burned, that they have said years later, even now that I have lived through it, I would still have preferred to have died. Wow. Like even yes. even knowing that they're now going to live a long fulfilled life. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. Because it's just such a painful yeah. way to go. Which wow. also makes me and this didn't, I didn't think about this when I was reading the story. It also makes me think mad props for like the monks during Vietnam War Holy crap, and the right? ones who just light themselves on fire with gasoline and they just not a peep. Right. Just right up to the moment they drop right. dead. And it's like, man, I don't have that kind of conviction for anything. No. I wish I did. I, I just step on a nail yeah. and I'm a yeah. <laughs> screaming. Yeah. It's yeah. Banshee. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, definitely jump. We need a cheerier story for next week. I know, right? Something. What is our story? Yeah, two well, cats walk into a bar. Dog, we, dog won't serve them. <laughs> uh, if you're that writer, please, please write. Submit. To yeah. write two cats <laughs> so, walk so into a bar. You, right, so you have been. Uh, we still haven't gotten a copy, uh, the narrative copy of the uh, of the the, the trolley problem. The trolley problem. It's coming. Though, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, you've been listening to After Dinner Conversation, short stories for long conversations uh, with myself, Colby, and Jessica, and Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, and we always have, a, maybe not this week, but we normally always have a great time discussing <laughs> our stories and heckling each other. This was a little bit of a sad one, uh, but, but, a, but a good one, a worthy discussion. Uh, if you've got a story you'd like to submit, feel free to email it to After Dinner Conversation. If you've enjoyed this conversation in the sense that you found it fulfilling, not in the sense that you found it fun, uh, then you know, like and subscribe. It means a lot to us. Uh, if you're in the Tempe area, come by La Guitarra to adopt a cat or pay a couple of bucks oh, to at least so hang cute. out with a cat. Uh, see, this we didn't even think about that. That we cats need another would have survived. The cats, the cats, cats can survive seven foot drops because yeah. they like sprawl out and they're like they get become like a cat a shoot, <laughs> and they were they're they're fine. Uh, yeah, like and subscribe, submit stuff, uh, download these on Amazon, and uh, thank you for joining us again. Next week's story will be the two rainbow, cats walk into a bar. Yes. Oh, no, it's not it. Not what, it. Is it what is it, Jeremy? The rainbow people of the glittering glade. I love this story. I'm just going to, I know you it's thought it was. Story. You, you no, it was just long. It was just long. But I loved it. But I feel like it wasn't long and wasted. It was actually no. long and, like, solid. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, three kingdom wharfs. I don't know what that word is. Wards. You wrote it. Wards. There's no <laughs> F there. Three kingdom wards, people who protect the kingdom, are sent to investigate the reclusive rainbow people of the shifting desert. Uh, and I really, honestly, if you submit a story called Rainbow People of the Glittering Glade, you pretty much automatically get published, I feel uh, like. Yeah. I was the opposite. I saw the title and was like, like nope. So pretentious. <laughs> I was like, nope, that's a big nope for me. Yeah. I was wrong, guys. You were wrong. It was delightful. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. We will see you at the next one. Yeah. Bye.